All right, so this is chapter, uh, the first part of chapter four in research methods in psychology. Uh, so as you can see, we're going to be talking about measurement and data analysis. So uh, <clears throat> before we begin, I just want to go over some of the objectives, which are uh, just things that you should learn from, go, uh, from going over this material. So first of all, uh, you'll want to understand what psychologists mean when they use the term construct. Now, if you're in my class, I've talked about this a little bit before, and I'm going to go into a bit more detail on it today. Uh, also, you should be able to uh, recognize the uh, wide variety of different measures that psychologists can use to, uh, to measure these constructs. <clears throat> and uh, then finally, I'd like you to be able to understand how we decide when it's appropriate to use different measures. Uh, and how these measures are developed. <clears throat> so, um, in the last chapter that we went over, uh, we were talking about evaluating theories and like the relationship between theory and data. And so one of the broad goals that we have as scientists is to evaluate these theories in the light of evidence. Right? And <clears throat> uh, typically it's the case that uh, these theories describe these uh, abstract constructs. And so these constructs are just hypothetical factors. They're things that, uh, <clears throat> that we believe exist and that explain uh, some aspect of human behavior and, and thinking. Right? And so one hypothetical factor that I've used before, one example of a construct, is hunger. Right? Uh, so we all know what hunger feels like. Uh, but it's something that really can't be directly measured. You can't just get a precise measurement of somebody's amount of hunger like you can other variables like uh, their height. You can like, go up to somebody with a ruler and get a pretty precise measurement of height, but uh, you have to be a little bit more creative when measuring something more abstract like hunger. Right? And so, <clears throat> uh, since you can't directly measure a construct like this uh, because of its abstract nature, we have to make inferences about them. And an inference is uh, sort of like an, an educated guess. Like we, we're measuring something, and we can try to measure it as precisely as possible, but there's a little bit of uh, a leap that we have to take to say that uh, this thing that we're measuring is actually directly related to this hypothetical abstract construct. Right? <clears throat> and so we can make inferences about these constructs based on a number of different things. Uh, we can make inferences about them based on behaviors. So in one of my previous lectures, I, uh, <clears throat> when we talked about operational definitions, uh, I had uh, gone over some different potential behaviors that could relate to hunger. So, uh, <clears throat> and I'd asked the class for examples too. And, some, uh, and we'll talk about some of those again in just a second. Uh, we can also make inferences about these constructs based on circumstances. Right? And so I'll, I'll go over what I mean here in just a second as well. So if we look at some possible behaviors that uh, might relate to hunger, it could be something like eating. Right? So if somebody is presented with a certain quantity of food and they eat a lot of it, then uh, you would infer that that person was probably pretty hungry. Uh, if, that, say, if a different person was presented with that same amount of food and by comparison they didn't eat very much, then you could infer that they probably weren't as hungry as that first person. Right? Um, another type of behavior would be uh, like a self-report. Now some people would say that that's a bit of a leap to say that a self-report is a type of behavior, but it's the person saying that uh, that they have these feelings of hunger. Right? So we said that you could ask somebody to rate how hungry they are on like a one to seven uh, Likert scale. Right? <clears throat> so that's, uh, these are examples of behaviors that could reflect f feelings of hunger. Circumstances would be uh, things like, well, if somebody has gone a long time without eating food, like if, if somebody goes 12 hours without eating anything, then uh, that is a circumstance under which you would expect a person to have some feelings of hunger. Um, <clears throat> another example that I talked about in a previous lecture was uh, measuring somebody's blood sugar. So that's not really a behavior, it's not a self-report, it's just a biological circumstance. Uh, and 
we know pretty well that when somebody's blood sugar drops down, they have some psychological feelings of hunger. They're motivated to go get the nutrients that they need to maintain homeostasis, to, to keep their body going. Right? So <clears throat> these are all specific things that we could measure that would then, again, allow us to make an inference about how hungry the person is, even though we're still not directly measuring this abstract factor of hunger uh, when we measure any of these things. Right? So <clears throat> um, Another thing that I had talked about uh, toward the end of the last chapter was the idea that in order to evaluate these theories, uh, what scientists do is they test hypotheses that are uh, derived from the theory or, or uh, deduced from the theory. And so in order to do this, in order to test these hy hypothetical if-then statements, if somebody is hungry, then we should observe this behavior. Uh, what we have to do is establish really clear, specific operational definitions. And you've had some experience doing this in lab, if you're taking the lab with me right now. But, uh, but as I said, these are just really, really precise measures of, uh, or pre precise accounts of how these constructs are being measured. Right? Um, so, uh, we have to, when starting up a line of research or designing a new study, uh, one of the first things that you have to do is decide exactly what you need to measure in order to test your hypothesis. Um, because a lot of people have these ideas about how constructs might be related, but they might not have given a lot of thought to exactly how you could measure some specific factor that uh, would be a reflection of those constructs. Right? So you've got to ground these things in reality. <clears throat> so uh, if you are proposing a study looking at depression, it's not sufficient. It's not enough to say that you're going to measure depression. You have to get much more precise than that. So you could say that uh, you have to state how you're measuring that. You could say that you're going to measure depression using the Beck Depression Inventory, which is a pretty widely used self-report scale that uh, is supposed to reflect somebody's level of depressive feelings. Um, if you're going to measure self-esteem as, say, an independent or dependent variable, again, it's not sufficient to just say, uh, we're going to measure self-esteem. You have to come up with a more precise operational definition saying, uh, we are going to measure self-esteem by using some specific method, like the, the Rosenberg self-esteem scale. It's another self-report measure. And uh, <clears throat> so those abstract things, like depression or self-esteem, once again, are examples of constructs. Right? You can't directly see them. You can't directly measure them. So instead, you have to use some type of instrument or something like that uh, to make an inference about somebody's level of depression or somebody's level of self-esteem. All right, <clears throat> so uh, uh, in order to you know, make this leap, we have to decide uh, specifically what we're going to measure. And the possibilities are almost limitless here. Um, <clears throat> so there are a lot of different ways to measure these constructs. Uh, one that I've alluded to several times already in this lecture is self-report. Right? So self-report measures uh, <clears throat> are pretty widely used. Uh, this is something you're probably familiar with, uh, like a survey uh, or a questionnaire where somebody just sits down with paper and pencil or on a computer and answers questions about their behavior or their feelings or their thoughts. Right? And um, <clears throat> so if you are looking at uh, anxiety, for example, uh, you could ask somebody about how much stress they're experiencing at their job. Uh, or you could use a, a questionnaire that's designed to measure uh, how burned out they're feeling. So uh, do, they, uh, do they feel like, less satisfied with their job? Uh, if they go on a vacation, how satisfied are they with that? So these are all things that you could ask somebody about that might relate to their level of stress. And even something like stress or anxiety, those two are abstract hypothetical constructs. 
that we have to make inferences about based on specific responses. Right? And so, <clears throat> uh, what you could do if you were interested in studying something along these lines is have participants complete measures of these types of things uh, before, during, and after a vacation. Right? So you can see how much stress they're experiencing before uh, they go on vacation. Uh, you could have them complete a measure of how they're feeling during a vacation, and then you could see how they feel maybe about their jobs and how stressed out they are after their vacation. So you could track the degree of change in stress uh, over time using a self-report. Right? <clears throat> and then uh, you could use that to test some hypothesis about uh, how effective vacations are in reducing somebody's overall level of stress. Right? Um, so, like I said, self-reports are very commonly used uh, because they're, uh, they're pretty cheap to do, uh, they're pretty easy to, to use, but uh, they do have some limitations. Uh, there are a number of uh, biases that people have that can come out in their self-reports, like positive illusions about themselves. Uh, sometimes they don't pay attention to the questions, sometimes they misinterpret the questions, uh, sometimes they... Uh, just try to present themselves in uh, a very positive light. We'll talk more about all these limitations uh, a little bit later in the semester. So, uh, because of all those limitations, um, a lot of psychologists try not to overuse surveys and questionnaires. So if we're not using these, what's something else that we could use? Well, you could, uh, like I said, the possibilities are almost limitless. So you could do something like measure physiological activity. Um, so if you were interested in, uh, in let's stick with stress, uh, you could measure somebody's blood pressure. Right? So uh, we know that when people have more stress, typically they get an elevated uh, level of blood pressure. Right? And so there are some really precise measurements that you can take. Uh, but one limitation to this is that uh, these physiological measures don't typically tell you a lot about cognition, so about what exactly somebody is thinking or, or feeling uh, when these measures change. Right? So let's just say that you are interested in this idea of uh, there being a distinction in stress response between people with different personality types. So you've, you've probably heard of the, the notion of type A and type B personality, although there are some people who are, some researchers who are kind of skeptical about that. Uh, <clears throat> so what you could do if you were interested in that is, first of all, use a self-report measure. So get one of these questionnaires that tries to determine whether somebody is more along the lines of a type A personality, you know, tightly wound, a uh, high stress response, or a type B personality. And then in conjunction with that, um, you could get a physiological measurement. Uh, so uh, have a recording of the participant's blood pressure changes uh, taken while they're performing some type of difficult task. Right? And uh, so one example of a task that you could have somebody complete while uh, measuring their blood pressure is something called a, uh, well, it's a short-term memory capacity task. Right? So you could have uh, people uh, listen to these strings of numbers and then do their best to repeat them. Right? And we know that the capacity of short-term memory is 7 plus or minus 2. So the more numbers that you start adding on here, the harder it is for people to uh, repeat all those numbers back. They'd probably be rel uh, it'd probably be relatively easy to recite a short string of 5 or 6 uh, numbers, but once you get up to these higher levels, that's a real challenge, and that's something that you know, may not be the most stressful thing that somebody could do. It's not as stressful as, uh, as like having to come in and take a really important test, like going to take the GRE or something like that, um, but it is a moderately stressful task, and so you should uh, be able to see changes in people's blood pressure while they do that. And so you can see if there's a difference in the degree of change in blood pressure between people uh, who are type A when they complete this task and people who are type B when they complete that task. And so given what we know, you would probably predict that uh, 
uh, there would be a bigger jump in blood pressure and stress reactivity for type A personalities than for type B personalities when they're doing this task. Okay? So, um, so we've talked about physiological measurements, we've talked about self-reports. Um, <clears throat> another very popular type of thing to measure is overt behavior. So, uh, when we say that something is overt, we mean that it's, it's open to view. You can look at somebody and see how they're acting. Right? And so let's say that you want to study moral behavior and how people's uh, moral behavior changes depending on certain situational factors. Right? Well, uh, there's this classic social line of social psychology research that I talk about in my social psych class. That, uh, that looks at exactly that. And uh, so an example of an overt behavior that you could look at that relates to morality would be stealing. So you could give somebody the opportunity to steal some pieces of candy uh, that the researcher has put out or to steal some money that has been left out in a public area. Right? And uh, <clears throat> so in this classic line of research, um, what the experimenters did was they invited children into this laboratory and uh, first of all they uh, they made a note of the circumstances so uh, they would note whether the children were in groups or whether they had arrived alone and uh, this is one of those research ideas that might have come from an everyday observation like we have talked about in a previous chapter so um, when you've been out trick-or-treating as a kid, you might have noticed that sometimes there was a house where uh, there was a bowl of candy set out and it had a sign up that said, please take one piece or something like that. And, and maybe you took more than one piece, maybe you only took one piece. But the question here is, how do these situational factors affect whether people take the one piece that they are allowed or whether they take more than their fair share? Um, <clears throat> so. So one factor that might impact this is uh, whether you're in a group with other children or whether you are just by yourself. Right? Uh, the other thing that these researchers looked at was, uh, well, in one condition they would ask the, pe the children when they came up for their name. In another condition they would allow the children to remain anonymous. Right? And then, uh, so these kids would arrive at the lab, either in groups or alone, they would be identified or anonymous. And then the researchers would leave and they would uh, allow the children to have the opportunity to uh, take some candy and they were allowed one piece so they would see did they just take one piece uh, or did they take more and they would make this observation from behind a screen so the, the children were under the impression that they were not in the presence of the researcher when they were being surreptitiously observed. And uh, there was also some money that had been left out on a nearby table. And so the, observe, the researchers also observed whether those kids took any of this money that had been left out. And so, um, although we're more interested in the process of research in this class than the content of the research, uh, you may be interested to know that children were most likely to take uh, uh, take this extra candy or to uh, to steal the money that was left out uh, when they were uh, in groups and when they were anonymous. They were least likely to take extra candy uh, if they were alone and identified by name. Right? And so the thinking here is that uh, if people are alone and identified by name and the researcher notices that the money is missing or that uh, there was extra candy taken, then they would have to conclude that it was that one person and they know who that person is. Whereas if they're anonymous and in a group, you get this kind of diffusion of responsibility. So uh, the children might have been thinking, well, if the researcher notices that uh, somebody took extra candy, they don't know my name, they don't know if it was me or one of the other children. Right? And so, uh, and so again, this is just an, exa an example of uh, studying overt behavior that relates to an abstract hypothetical construct of 
moral behavior or moral thinking. Right? So you can't directly measure moral thinking or moral thought processes, but you can measure behavior that has some relation to morality or immorality. All right. So, uh, uh, so those are three big categories of uh, potential measurement. Right? Uh, overt behavior, physiological measurement, and self-report. Those are really widely used. Now, at this point, you might be wondering, well, if I'm designing a study, as you're required to do for this course, how do I decide which one of these I'm going to use? How do I decide how to measure something specific that relates to my constructs of interest? Well, the first thing that you're really going to want to do when starting a new line of research or designing a new study is to conduct a literature review. And so you should have uh, some idea of how to use psych info at this point to conduct a literature review. We've done that in the lab. Um, and so, well, how does this help? Well, uh, you can look at other research that has been done that's relevant to your topic of interest and see how these other researchers have measured uh, these constructs. What operational definitions did they use? Uh, did they use uh, a self-report instrument? This is a great way to learn about what instruments uh, have been developed and, and that you could apply to your line of research. So if there is something that has worked well for other researchers, well, you could use that same measure yourself. There's no need to reinvent the wheel. Uh, it isn't a problem to not do everything from scratch. In fact, oftentimes it's better uh, to use a well-validated instrument than to just come up with something off the top of your head. Uh, so, like I said, you could use a measure that other people have used, or you could potentially uh, do a slight modification of an existing measure. And I actually did this in some of my research that I did for my uh, master's thesis uh, back in the day. Uh, so, um, with my research there, I was looking at risk-taking behavior. And so, uh, I found some uh, popular research that had used this uh, blackjack game, right, where people are uh, presented with a, uh, a blackjack hand and they're asked to uh, either take a hit, so get another card, or to uh, they have the option to stay and not take another card. And the, uh, the situation is set up so that it's a really risky hand. Right? Uh, so it's, it's a close chance, uh, almost 50-50, that they would bust if they take another card or that, uh, that the dealer would beat them if they didn't take another card. Right? And so, uh, again, they're given this option to hit or stay. So in the previous research that I had found, the researchers just used a single trial. Uh, so giving people the choice with this one hand, are you going to hit or stay? And I just slightly modified this in my work. Uh, and I increased the number of trials to five uh, so that we could get a, little, a slightly more precise measurement of that person's level of risk-taking at the time of the experiment. So instead of just saying this person took a risk or this person didn't take a risk, I could say this person didn't take any risks, they took one risk, two risks, three risks, four risks, five risks. So that would give me more of a continuous measure uh, of risk-taking. And that seemed to work out pretty well. You know, the study worked and I got it published, so hooray. Uh, <clears throat> So those literature reviews can be very helpful for coming up with ideas for how to measure what you need to measure. Uh, another important element in deciding uh, how to measure these constructs is, well, you have to look at the nature of your research question. So certain things can only be measured in specific ways. So let's go back to uh, the example of helping behavior, or, or the abstract construct of helping. So, uh, could you measure helping using a self-report? Well, sure. Right? You could ask people uh, how often they engage in different helpful behaviors. You could ask them uh, how helpful they think they are. You could ask them something like, uh, how 
uh, frequently they volunteer for uh, for opportunities to help other people, how many hours of community service work they voluntarily do within a year, uh, things like that. Right? So that would be one way of measuring helping behavior. Um, could you measure helpfulness via a physiological measurement? Well, that might be kind of tricky. Uh, these physiological measurements, although they can be really precise, uh, as I said, are somewhat limited. Right? So looking at something like heart rate, blood pressure, uh, galvanic skin response, like how much somebody is sweating, uh, that doesn't really directly relate to uh, helping. You, know? uh, you might be able to get creative and, and measure a physiological variable uh, and try to make it related to helping. So maybe have somebody watch a video of somebody who is in need of help and see how much distress they experience uh, when they see that somebody needs help. Um, and that might be somewhat related to, uh, to empathy or helpful behavior, but it's not as directly related as some other things that you could measure. And uh, you have to be really careful in what you choose because if you measure something uh, that is not really a valid representation of your construct, then that's going to cause you lots of headaches later on down the line because you'll submit this paper for review and the reviewers will say, well, you said you were measuring helping behavior, but you're actually measuring something else. Uh, so, like I said, you have to be really careful about this. And uh, then uh, another possibility that we talked about was overt behavior. So could you measure helping by looking at overt behavior? This one's probably the most obvious yes answer, right? Um, I've, I've used this as examples before. You could go out and look at something like uh, door holding or uh, how likely people are to uh, assist another person if they uh, trip and fall or, uh, ac or pretend to accidentally drop something, right? Uh, so that's probably the most direct way of measuring helping behavior. Uh, <clears throat> another factor that's important to take into account when determining how uh, you're going to measure these constructs is, well, it depends in part on the nature of your participants. Right? So uh, there are certain populations that pose a special challenge, uh, like infants and young children. So uh, we've got these three categories that we talked about, uh, self-reports, physiological measurements, and overt behavior. Self-reports are usually not going to be very effective with infants and young children, especially infants. They haven't developed the, the language ability to be able to communicate things about themselves very well. They can't read a questionnaire. Uh, so most self-report measures are pretty much out of the question when it comes to studying these types of populations. What about physiological measurements? Well, some of these, yes, you can use pretty well on infants. You can measure things like heart rate and blood pressure and so on. But um, a lot of infants can get pretty squeamish about having things attached to them. So if you're trying to measure heart rate in an adult, uh, an adult will understand that having some uh, device attached to their hand isn't going to hurt them. And so you could get a pretty uh, accurate measurement using that. But uh, kids will squirm around, they might freak out just by having something attached to them, and that would really throw the measurement off. So, um, so even though it's possible to measure those types of variables in young kids, um, uh, it isn't always that effective. Uh, and then we've got overt behavior. So we said that, that self-reports are out of the question. You can't have kids answer these questions. Uh, but... Uh, there is this classic line of research that looks at uh, the types of things that capture the attention of newborn infants. And so, for example, they find that uh, these uh, newborns tend to gaze longer at patterns resembling a, a human face. So they would stare longer at this type of an image than at this type of an image, because it looks like it has eyes and a mouth or eyes and a nose. And so uh, that was some early evidence indicating that even at birth, uh, we uh, well, human beings tend to be uh, more attentive toward things like social cues uh, or human facial patterns. Right? We come pre-wired to gaze at these things. 
Uh, also, you tend to see that uh, newborn infants are likely to turn their heads in the direction of the sound of a human voice. And they're not as likely to do this if they hear non-human sounds, like the, the beeping of a machine in the hospital room. Right? And so uh, when you're looking, uh, when you're measuring something like how long an infant gazes at these different patterns, or where they turn their heads, uh, those are overt behaviors. Right? And we're using those overt behaviors to measure abstract constructs like uh, attention or attentiveness. Right? And uh, so uh, typically overt behavior is the best, most reliable way to study psychological processes in infants and young children, since these other things uh, are often not as effective. <clears throat> uh, another way that this is done is to use observer reports. So uh, either the researcher, him or herself, or uh, an assistant, or the parent, or a teacher. Uh, any of these parties can observe the behavior of a young child and then report on that. And, and again, that's just another way of measuring that overt behavior. Okay. So anyway, that's the main thing that I wanted to cover in this lecture. So uh, use that when designing your study for this class, when coming up with uh, uh, how you're going to measure the constructs in your proposal. So thank you for your attention and have a great day.